Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Amen. Lord, we lift you up. Hallelujah. When that song first started, I was listening. The beat came on. And the first thing Ricky and I, Minister Grover and I, was sitting here. We said, is that Cupid Shuffle? <laughs> I said, wait a minute. Who's getting ready to do the Cupid Shuffle up here? It's like, now wait just a minute. How many know what Cupid Shuffle is? Well, come on, put them hands up. Some people looking around like, what is he talking about? I see some people looking down, kind of. <laughs> you know what the Cupid Shuffle is. That's a dance that started off, I don't know where, but it's a black folk dance. Ain't that right, Phil? Phil? Phil, come demonstrate it. <laughs> no. No, I'm just kidding. I did hear that beat first for a minute there, and I looked around, and Minister Grover read my mind. But anyway, it's surely an honor and a privilege to be here, uh, over here on the side on the iPad. We got uh, First Lady on FaceTime. She's FaceTiming us from uh, Iowa. Isn't technology something else? You know, when I talk to uh, Pastor Freddie, I talk all the time, FaceTime to uh, London to him, and we talk for hours, and I start to think, ooh, this is costing money. Oh, no. No, it's, uh, it's, it's about how or who your provider is. But we have a chance to communicate that way. Amen. Uh, I just want to again say, uh, give an honor to God to, uh, again, to the late Pastor Bugs and his honor and to all the ministers, deacons, and each and every one of you. Again, I just can't say it enough. It's an honor to uh, be used by God to bring forth his word. Uh, to be appointed and anointed to do this because it's not in my nature but it's in the spirit what the Holy Spirit wants us to do we just got to be willing you see God doesn't require us to have great abilities he just wants us to be available to do his work so I just thank God so we're going to start with a word of prayer Father God I thank you this day oh God for being God by yourself I thank you, O Lord, for uh, what you've done for us, what you're doing through us, Central Baptist. Now, Father, as, we, as I go forward, Father, I ask that you would just speak through me. Use me as your vessel that I may bring honor to you for the things that I say to your people. So I thank you today, Lord. I give you praise, honor, and glory in advance for all the things that you'll be saying through me. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. And all the saints of God said amen. 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 I uh, want to call your attention to Proverbs, the 19th chapter. And it's a verse of scripture. I'm going to use as a springboard today. A verse of scripture, Proverbs 19 and 17. And if you're able to stand, you could stand. If you're not able, I understand. But... The scripture, again, comes from Proverbs 19 and 17, and it reads as follows. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he repay again. You may be seated. Just a simple scripture, but it's a lot of scriptures I'm going to be hitting you with today. And I want to use as a title, Generous Stewards. God's Generous Stewards is the title of this message. And here in this proverb, God is directing our attention to the needy or the poor. I've talked about this before, but I want to get a little more in depth, and I want to use Scripture to back everything that I talk about today with Scripture. And what I believe is that God values every one of his children whether that person is rich or whether they're poor. God values them. But here in this proverb in particular, God is saying that when we give to the needy, we are giving to God. And what God does is pays back those loans that we give to those people in full. And many times it's over and 
beyond what we could ever imagine or think. More than what we could ever imagine and think. And so God is identifying with the poor folks here. And even when we read in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, Jesus goes in detail in talking about this, being generous stewards. Just in case many of you didn't know that in the Bible, there are 500 verses on prayer, but there are over 2,000 verses that deal with generosity or money, either way you want to put it. And also, when we look at it, 40% of what Jesus' parables deal directly with is money. 40% of what Jesus deals with is money. And the thing that we look at here is which clearly lets us know that we're going to be accountable to how we have demonstrated our stewardship and managed the money that God has loaned us or God has allowed us to manage, which clearly gives us an understanding that God is serious about this. And yes, every nickel we have and get is God's money. Scriptures clearly say that, the earth of the Lord's and the fullness thereof, Psalm 24. That means us. That means everything that we have. We, everything belongs to God, which clearly lets us know that. So I want to give you several points here today I want to touch on. Several points that I want to touch on that I, may, that I think we all need to be doing with God's money. It's not ours. We may see my money, but it's God's money. And God can make it disappear. God can make it multiply. It's up to God how he wants to do it. But he uses us to see how we will manage it. It's a free will thing, but God wants to see how we manage that. And remember the key words here are manage, to manage. Because we are only managers of what rightly belongs to God. So I'm going to be hitting you with quite a few verses of scriptures. So I want to encourage you, take out, write some notes, because I want you to research this. Don't just take my word, but go to the word of God and look it up for yourself so that you can be rightly in line, knowing that this preacher is not standing here just spewing out some stuff, but preaching and showing you the doctrine of God's word. So my first point is this here. The first thing that, I, that we should do in order to become generous stewards is to give to the less fortunate folks. And that's what this spring off scripture tells us. Give to the less fortunate folks. And again, if you look at uh, uh, Proverbs 19.72, we read here, every time you give to someone less fortunate, you're not just giving to them. But you're giving to God. You're giving to the Lord as well. And whenever God sees you doing this, God will put it right back in your pocket or your purse or your pocketbook, whatever you want to call it. And he multiplies it. He gives more. Whenever God sees you doing this, God is going to take care of you. God is going to bless you. And if we look at another verse of Scripture, Proverbs 21 and 13. Proverbs 21 and 13, and look what the scripture says. Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. This is God's word. This is God's word. So when we don't give to those that are in need and we reject them, that are crying for help, plug our ears, God sees that. In other words, if God shows you that someone has a financial need and you say, man, I don't hear a thing. You say, I mean, look here, dude, go on about your business. Get on up out of here. I'm busy right now. I'm trying to build my wealth so I could be on top of things. I work for my money. You need to go work for yours. Go bum somebody else. Now, if this is a, someone in seri serious financial need, God looks to us to bless them. God says in his word, the poor you'll always have with you. And the thing is, is that who does he expect to take care of them? Those that are well off or those that have something to help out. And that's when God says, okay, all right. In your time of need, whenever you cry out to me, 
I'm not going to be generous with you. I'm going to do you the same way you did one of mine. So this is what God says. And then when we look at Proverbs 22 and 9, Proverbs 22 and 9, the scripture says this. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. In other words, God wants us to have a generous eye uh, or a bountiful eye eye, which is a generous eye. God wants us to look for opportunities to help someone else, not just wait for people to ask, but when we see someone in need, God wants us to step forward to help them. This is what generosity is, but we are to be generous to the less fortunate folks who have not. That's what we're here to do. See, God wants us to have that generous eye and if we really want to have the heart of God, we would want to be generous to the poor folks. Why? It's because there's so many scriptures in God's word that talk about God's desire to take care of the poor. To take care of the poor. See, and I believe that if we want to be like Jesus, then we would make this a priority in our lives. This church was built on generosity, the generosity of a man who's seen the need of others. And I've seen this man, Pastor Bugs, give to many people, a man that took out of his pocket and gave, constantly reaching out. I didn't understand it at the time, but I fully understand it now as I study God's word, the generosity that helped to bring this church up where it is, to bring this church to be paid off, to bring him to where he had no need of nothing. It's because of the generosity of someone's heart. That's how we got here today. But when we look back at God's word, God is calling us to be generous stewards and we need to, to, uh, to, to be focused on uh, doing God's will. Moving on to my second point. The second point is this. In order for us to move into that generosity state of generous stewards is to invest our money. Invest it. Proverbs 31 and 16 says this. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planted the vineyard. And this is dealing, this verse is talking about the virtuous woman who goes out and evaluates the fields to see if it's a good investment or not. She inspects it first very thoroughly, and then she goes and purchases this field, and then she uses her earnings to invest that. And then she purchases other things worthy of investment. This is a virtuous woman that the man fully trusted with her earnings to do what she needed, a virtuous wife, rather. And a woman that invests in good things that's going to benefit the family is a great woman, a woman that thinks like Christ. Ecclesiastes 11.2. Ecclesiastes 11 and 2, and it reads thus. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. So in other words, the writer here is saying that it's wise to put all your money, it's, excuse me, it's not wise to put all your money in one basket. Put in seven or even eight baskets to put that money aside for a rainy day to be ready. Because it takes if at one basket takes a loss, that's not all your, your eggs in that one basket. You're spreading it around to where you have seven or eight more. So invest it so we're ready for the future, ready for whatever comes. This is wisdom we're looking at here. Solomon, one of the wisest men, was in Ecclesiastes here giving us instructions. So what we look at here, and even when we look at Matthew 25, we have the parable where Jesus was telling us that one guy had, one, had given one talent, was given one talent, another guy was given another talent, another guy was given two, another guy was given five, and then the guy that was given two talents and five talents went out and made more talents with the ones that were given him. And as a result, they were commended because they had invested and they had managed and stewarded what was given to them. 
what was given to him. So whenever we make investments with God's money that allows us to, to manage this money of God's, make double sure that your motives for investing are not to become richer, but to better your position to give also to the less fortunate. It's not to get rich, but it's also to help the less fortunate. Make double sure that we have the right mindset when we are building some type of a, a, a nest egg or a comfort to be ready for retirement. That's why I said, how many retired here today? And half the church hands went up and it was laughter. There was joy. People started talking. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm retired. And, and the ones that weren't retired, I said, how many are not retired? They was kind of like. Retirement is great when you prepare properly for it. You know, Pastor Bug said a joke one time. A man said, uh, uh, told his wife, put away for a rainy day. Be prepared for a rainy day. When the rainy day came, he said, look here, how that, uh, the car, the transmission is gone and it's ran out. We need the money. Have we got money for it? No, we don't have money for it. Why don't we have money for it? Because you didn't tell me. I said, I said, put away for a rainy day. She said, well, I got two umbrellas put aside. Huh? So the point is, is that we need to put a way to prepare for that time of need. Time of need. My third point here is this. Get out of debt. Get out of debt. Some people look at the debt and say, oh, it's so much. It's so much debt. I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can do that. But it's possible. If you trust God and believe God and you have self-control and you're willing to sacrifice, we can do it. Some of us are not willing to sacrifice to do that. We'd rather get what we want, satisfy this flesh, buy all the stuff we want, but it's hard. I know this is a tough message because I can tell how you're looking at me. You look at me, go sit down. But it's the reality, and I have to preach the word of God. One of the things that, that, that God told me was you got to preach the entire gospel whether it comes to money, whether it comes to spiritual life, and this is a spiritual thing. And the fact is, is that God wants us to be stewards and generous stewards with that what he manages or he gives us to manage. But in Proverbs, here's, here's what it says. Proverbs 22 and 7. Proverbs 22 and 7 says this. The rich ruleth over the poor and the borrow is the servant to the lender. Until you get out of debt, we will be a slave to someone else who we owe. And when you fail and you miss that payment, they have every right to call you. They have every right to drag you in court to sue you or whatever they need to do. And we could cry and gripe and complain, but you're signed on that, so that line that says signature. And when you do that, you, you got to take care of it. It's the money you owe them. And that's not God's perfect will for our life is to owe somebody. The Bible says, owe no man nothing but, did I hear it? Who said it? Say it loud. Love. Owe no man nothing but love. That's scripture. Scripture. See, and that's God's will for us. And the scripture says, also, why is it right before that 22.7 and 22.6, we've seen it here just recently, 22.6, it says this, train up a child in a way that he or she, it says he, should go, and when he is old, he won't depart from that. Oh, it's kind of odd to me why that scripture is right before that, and then he goes into the borrows of slave oh, anyway. But the scripture has meaning, and when we follow God's word, we've got to also teach our children how to be managers over that which they, at some point, will have, which is money. When you get a job, one of the things we taught our children, Dorcas and I, is that we have to teach our children how to manage. When our babies were young, we got them debit cards, and we took them and showed them how to use them and told them how to use the account, what amount they should tithe, and what amount, how to spend, and how to be wise. Now, when they're older, maybe not old yet, but when they get to that point and they realize we don't have money, they're going to realize, I need to change some things. And some of us here need to change some things. 
Uh, over 20 years ago, I was constantly going uh, laid off jobs. I worked for Douglas, they laid me off. I worked for Boeing in Space, they laid me off. Boeing Aircraft laid me off. And even worked for uh, Lever Brothers, a soap company, laid me off. And I said, Lord, if you just get me back where I'm supposed to be, I will do what you want me to do, which is tithe. And when God uh, gainfully employed me, me and my wife decided we're going to give, we're going to tithe, we're going to do what we're supposed to do. And God has multiplied and even went over that as far as keeping me employed, as far as taking care of our finances, as far as taking care of the debt, as far as our spiritual walk, and we're able to give to others. And it's amazing when we do and trust God with everything that we have, not just our being, but everything, our material things, the money we have, everything, God is going to open up that window and he's going to pour out a blessing to where you will not have room to receive. This is biblically, this is stuff that is so spiritual. And, and, and trust me, when we fail to trust God, we're saying, God, I don't believe you. I don't trust you. I don't know about this. But we've got to put every bit of our trust in God and trust him. But 20, uh, in, in Psalm 37 and 21, Psalm 37 and 21, it reads this way. The wicked borroweth, it, borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. So in other words, wicked folks, they steal under disguise of borrowing. To never pay that back. See, the character of the good person is to give to those in need. You see somebody in need, you see some torn clothes, you're going to offer them food, you're going to offer, offer them some money or whatever it is. It's not up to us to try to decide whether they're going to do right with it. It's us to give and trust God in what they're going to do. Trust God that we're doing the right thing because it's a blessing that comes upon us. That's where it comes from. The difference is the wicked person thinks of himself as a taker. He's a taker. But the good person thinks of others, and he's a giver. He thinks outside of himself. That's a giver. That's a generous steward that God is talking about. So if you're just uh, uh, spending your money and not really giving it uh, no kind of thought, and you're just getting into more and more debt, then this is not just the best for your life. This is the best thing that God wants for your life. The Bible says that, there are, that we are to use our money that God blessed us with to first and foremost get out of debt, to not be a borrower to the lender or a borrower or a slave to the lender. God wants us to be a slave to Jesus Christ. That's the only person we should be a slave to is Jesus Christ. When we look at this, we find that the first and foremost thing that God wants us to do is be stewards, generous stewards, not just to others, but to God as well. Moving on to my fourth point. The fourth point is this, the thing that every Christian should know to be a generous steward is give to the ministry, give to the ministry. Now, this is the part where a lot of folks are going to get off the train and say, oh, here we go. Because I think, folks, the thing is, is that God wants us to be generous stewards. And I don't, I don't know about this right here. I don't, I, I don't trust these preachers. I don't trust these ministers and these ministries. They're just getting rich off of, of whatever they can. Well, it's not the, the, the idea of the preachers. It's you're planting a seed into the church that you're with. The light's got to be paid. We run 13 air conditioners each Sunday, 13 to make sure everybody's comfortable. And when it's cold, we fire up the heat. Not only that, we've got to pay for insurance for this property. This is a big piece of land. And, and not only that, folks have fallen and turned around and sued the church. But we just turn it over to the, the, to the insurance company, let them handle that. Folks fall down, somebody fall, they don't care about no church. We got to pay a nice big penny for that. The church has to pay for things. The church has to deal with upkeep. You drive by the church, you look up, you see that peeling on that, on that church needs some paint. That church needs some paint. What they doing? What's wrong with them? All these things have to be maintained. Let's flip it for a minute. Your house, you maintain it. 
How many uh, do remodel every 10 years? You still walking on that same Berber that you had in 1969? No, you done pulled the carpet out and put some hard wood. Hard wood costs money, don't it? Ain't too many smiles out there. But this is biblical. This is biblical stuff we going into here. See, here's the thing that I want you to see, folks. God loves us, and God wants us to be generous to it. God wants to bless every one of us here today. He really does. He wants us to be stewards of his money, his money, his stuff. He wants us to be stewards that are generous to others, others. Many people have come through these, the doors of these churches, and we've helped them. Many people have come through here, and we've been generous to help them, not just with food, but in financial areas. And that legacy started years ago. I want to keep that legacy going because it's God's will. See, one of the things, the Old Testament, here's the thing that I want you to see here in this fourth thing here. When I said give to the ministry, this concept was conformed, confirmed, or excuse me, confirmed and consists both in the Old and New Testament, if you read about it. The Old Testament, we had uh, giving in two ways. Was the tithe was like a tax in Malachi 3, verse 8 through 10. In the Old Testament, it was con considered a mandatory tax to give whether they wanted to or not. That was the Old Testament. And then second, in the Old Testament, in Exodus 35 and 29, they had what was called the free will offering. And here's what the text says in Exodus 35 and 29. I want to read it to you. Exodus 35 and 29, if you are taking notes and you want to follow with me. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work, which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. This was not, this, now look at this. This was not mandatory, but it was done by all those whose hearts were moved. And then looking at the New Testament scriptures, 1 Corinthians 9 and 11, Paul says it this way. If we have sown into you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Paul is simply saying, if, we're, if I'm spending, and this is Paul's word, Paul is saying, if I'm spending my entire life pouring into you spiritual wisdom that is changing your current life here, as well as changing your eternal life, then it, is it too much to ask that I can get some kind of material ward back in return so I can eat, so I can provide, so I can do what I need to do in life? That's what Paul is saying. And then also in 1 Corinthians 9 and 14, 1 Corinthians 9 and 14, Paul says this. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live the gospel. So in other words, God wants people to preach the word of God to be free from monetary concern so that they can give all of their time and all of their energy towards preparing their hearts to preach the word of God to people who are in need of it. This is Paul's words. So some pastors today in churches today, such as myself, we have to still go out and work as bivocational pastors in order to still provide in the high cost of living today. Health insurance, health premiums, auto insurance, and the list goes on in order to be able to provide to our family. So I understand, and, and I can relate to what Paul was saying here. Paul was also a bivocational pastor. He, he worked with Aquila and Priscilla. He went out with them to help. He was a tent maker by trade. And wherever town he went, he worked to build tents to provide for himself because he didn't want to bother the church too much. Then when we look over here, also in Galatians 6 and 6, Galatians 6 and 6, the Apostle Paul says this, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth 
in all good things. So Paul is saying anyone who is learning from their leaders should take care of their material needs, should take care of their material needs. And I believe that when uh, you are being fed spiritually, you should provide in your giving to your local church, your local church. Then my fifth point, moving on to the fifth point. Fifth point is this, accumulate an inheritance. Put away an inheritance. Here's Proverbs 13 and 22. Again, Proverbs 13 and 22. The writer says, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. So here again, all of us should be thinking about how can I put, a, put money aside? For our children's children, not the children, but just the, but the children's children. In other words, for generations to come, college fund. Kids are going to need to go to college. Kids are going to need to go to college once, at some point or another. Or just set them up in a good, positive way financially so that when we go on, the children won't have to struggle. The children will have an inheritance. Again, it's God's word. I brought it to you from God's word. So the children's don't have to struggle so that the benefits I have been blessed with will not just stop with me but be passed down to other generations or should I say the government don't take it from me and then my kids say hey you didn't sign you didn't put no living trust together or anything like that you didn't provide how, how am I going to do this because I'm going to tell you if you ever go into what's called probate, and your children have to go through that, is very expensive. It's not a joke. If you've never been through probate, I've been through it, it's not a joke. Cost us uh, nearly $70,000 to get things all arranged. And the thing is, is you don't want to go into that. You don't want to be dealing with that. So the idea is to pass on to the next generation in order to be generous stewards. Then my sixth point, and I'm going to move on to the, the last point. The sixth point is to prepare and save for an emergency. How many folks got an emergency fund put aside? Some of us don't, but uh, Genesis 41, 47 through 49. This is where Joseph becomes a ruler. Pharaoh and his servants had recognized and realized that Joseph was the man in which the Spirit of God was on. How did they know it? Because Joseph was a man that had the heart of God. And this is what the text says. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathereth up the food of seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn and the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. In other words, Joseph put food aside. Joseph was preparing for the famine. Joseph was, was ready and getting prepared, knew what was coming. He was preparing for that rainy day. There was no food. He had some food stored up. So uh, what you don't know can hurt you. God gives us what we know in here. I heard somebody say, uh, well, I'm not going to even say that. But the thing is, is we've got to be prepared and put something away. We drive cars. How many had car breakdowns? How many have got to a point where the car broke down enough? You said, I need a new car. So we look at that and say, well, I don't have no money. How am I going to get this? We go sign on the dotted line for a new car. We sign on the dotted line, then we want to pay that high interest rate. The interest you're paying into that, you could put that somewhere else. The fact is, is that we should be stewards of God's money. Put it away. You know you're going to need a car repaired sometime. You know you're going to know that heater, that water heater going to go out. You know something else, that pipe going to rupture in the ground in that house. Something is going to happen where you need to go to a reserve to pay for that whatever happens. Do we prepare? Do we put away for that rainy day? Do we don't just put away an umbrella or two or maybe even four for the kids too, but we've got to put away 
and be generous stewards of what God has allowed us to manage. What God has allowed us to manage. And I want to move up and wrap it up with my last point here. If I could find my last point, I got so much to cover here. It's just not even uh, funny, but I want to go on and wrap it up. If I can get to it. It's somewhere in here. Last point is this. When we have done all these things that we're supposed to do, when we have finished and followed God's orders and what God has told us to do with his money, then what happens is we can now enjoy enjoy life. Enjoy life. And it's not just, as I pointed out earlier, to give to the less fortunate. We done that. We invested it. We get, get out of debt. We give to the ministry. We accumulate her- inheritance. We save for that emergency. But now God wants to us enjoy. And as I said earlier, when I said how many are retired, there was a good response, a tremendous response. Because now you're ready. You are enjoying what you've been blessed with. You have been blessed with Ecclesiastes 5, 18 and 19. Ecclesiastes 5, 18 and 19, the scripture says this, Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is, it is excuse me, for it is his portion Verse 19, every man also to whom God has given riches and wealth and has given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. In other words, here in these scriptures, the writer is saying that God wants us to enjoy the gifts he's blessed us with. He wants us to enjoy those gifts thus just as he has given us. But not in a way that we are not generous to give as well as help other folks so that we can enjoy it on our own. God wants other folks to have an enjoyment as well. And if we are able to, we should reach out. If every one of us were to help someone, we could change this world as Christians. We could revolutionize what Christianity means and put the devil to shame. I believe that in closing, God, is he loves us so much. He wants us to be generous, cheerful stewards of his money. And I'm reminded of a scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. It says this, but this I say, which he, well, excuse me, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as his, he purposeth it in his heart, so let him not grudgingly out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Let me break it down a little more to you. I believe that a person who gives a little is a person who has little faith. I believe that when people have a lack of faith, it keeps us from becoming the generous stewards that God wants us to be. Our attitudes count much more what we are giving in a major way. I believe that the only way we can fully grasp what it really means to becoming a generous steward is only through the person of Jesus Christ. And if we have him rooted deep down in us, he will take us to another level. And the thing is, is that we can say that we love Jesus, but if we're generous, your acts will show how much you love him because the fruit will come off of that person. John 10, 10, Jesus said this, the thief cometh, but not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. He says, I come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. In other words, a thief is a taker who comes to get. But a giver is one who comes to give. God gave us his only begotten son that he would be the one that will save us from where we are, from our sin. Jesus wants people to live and have a life that's meaningful and purposeful and joyful. And the most of all, eternal. 
eternal. Jesus was so generous to the point that he gave himself to be beaten for me and you. Not only that, Jesus gave everything he had, his life. He didn't just give material, he gave himself so that we can have uh, the, the wealth and the things that are in eternal glory and also have an abundant life to be able to live here even though we're going to go through things and we're going to go through storms. But God said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. When I think of Jesus Christ, he gave himself to the point of death, not only to the point of death, but he was buried in a borrowed tomb. Not only that, the grave was sealed not only that, they put a guard there to guard it, to keep Jesus in. The fact is, is none of that could keep Jesus in because he got out of that grave. He got out for you and me to live with us, to live in us. He ascended when to be back on high, but he came back down to show for 40 days, to show the people, I live Jesus is the reason why we can do things that we do today. He is the reason for every season. See, when we keep Jesus, God's angel is the one that showed that man. Let me tell you something about Jesus here. Here, the reeling and the rocking when Jesus came. When Jesus' uh, angel came, they had to shake the earth up so that they'll know that you can't hold Jesus in that grave. Jesus came out of that grave. He showed himself to be what we know he is, which is king of kings. He scared those men till they dropped dead, those guards. He ascended back to be with the Father. He was seated right on the right hand of the Father and indwelling every believer. We have Jesus in us. We could overcome. We could be that what God calls us to be, which is generous givers. We could be generous stewards. Jesus came to empower us. And the thing that I want us to know this year is John 3.16 the middle of the Bible, the middle of the gospel that brings it to us. It says, for God so loved the word, the world that he gave, he gave, he gave. That word gave is so powerful to me. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in me will not perish but have everlasting life. I think of what Jesus did the entire gospel. It surrounds that particular verse. God's love is true. God gave the best that he had, which is his only son. And the fact that I want you to understand today is we can all become those generous givers. We've got to get right with God, get serious about our walk, become on a, grow to another level in our Christianity. We can't stay right there. We've got to grow up in Jesus. Know that Jesus is the reason. In Jesus, we're doing it for him. We want to take care of the less fortunate. God bless you. God keep you. May God continue to be with you. Praise the Lord. Let's give our pastor another hand for that message. The title, The General Stood. And the stood is just a caretaker of what God has bestowed upon you. Nothing we have is our own. If you die today or tomorrow, there's nothing you can take with you. Do you understand? Everything is God. He's just leaving it to you, and you decide what you're going to do with it, but he is allowing you to be a steward over it. Will everyone please stand? We're going to extend an invitation to someone who may not know God in the point of his or her sin. God is knocking at the door. He's asking you to let him in. Is there one today that does not know God and won't accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? You know, sometimes we come to church and we think everybody in church is saved. And it's not necessarily so. So we always extend invitation. Is there one? God loves you. He extend, extend invitation to you at this time. There may be someone here today that's out of a church home that want to reconnect with the church. We extend invitation to you today. Amen. God love you. And he don't want you to be out of the comfort of fellow Christians. Is there one? There may be someone here today that say, you know what? I've accepted Christ. I just want to be baptized to show the whole world that I've died to the old man and I've come up as a new man in Christ. 
I want to be baptized. Is that one today? I'm going to ask that you come forward. Whatever head bowed, whatever eyes closed. Dear God, we thank you for the message that went forward. Dear God, being a, a steward, dear God. We know that we're only stewards of things you have bestowed upon us, dear God. Dear God, we know that everything that we have is because of you. Forgive us, dear God, if we have mishandled the things you have given to us. Show us the way, dear God. For those who may be in debt that is over their head, dear God, show them, dear God, that they too can get out of debt if they only just relinquish their will into your will. For, dear God, you are a generous giver, dear God, for you have given your son as a sacrifice for our sin. You have showed us the way. You are our Father. You have modeled the way of giving for us, dear God. Allow us not to be selfish givers. Allow us to give out of the will that you have bestowed upon us, dear God. Not grudgingly or out of necessity, but allow us to be cheerful givers. Let us know in our heart and our spirit, dear God, that nothing we have is our own. And once we understand that, we can do your will as we are on this earth, dear God. So, dear God, we thank you for the message that went forward. We pray that it land on good soil, dear God. And for those who are not getting it right, let them get it right. Dear God, we just, we just love you, dear God, because you first loved us. Continue to bless this service as we go further, dear God. We ask this in Jesus' name I pray. Everyone say amen, amen, amen.